S rank is weird. You just spend less time there than any place else. In A rank, you're there for A minus, A and A plus with the same pool of players. In S plus, you can have anyone from S plus zero to S plus nine. But S rank is just one subdivision, so people tend to pass through in one direction or another pretty quickly. That seems to mean that there are fewer people in the matchmaking queue, and your experience can end up looking like this. We're going to have to make every match we can actually get into count. So here are some thoughts on how to advance yourself out of S rank in Splatoon 2. S rank players are getting to the point where improving their technical skill is becoming more difficult. There's a very high skill cap in Splatoon, and S rank is nowhere near hitting it. But I, as an X rank player, can't really steamroll through an entire S rank team the way I can in B rank. There are games that I'm not able to carry. There are games where other players have higher KAs than me. If I miss position, S rank players are starting to find picks on me. People who play more technical weapon classes, like chargers, are starting to find their aim and apply zoning pressure that I have to respect. Rollers are finally starting to swing their roller for movement in combat instead of trying to roll people over. I, I said rollers are starting to... Look, it's faster for movement, and it gives you more range for combat. Flick the roller. Let's get back on track. <clears throat> when I beat an S rank player, it's generally coming down to their tactical decision making, and probably also their aim. Let's look at this 2v1 that I'm able to win. We're going to slow that down and talk about it. The engagement starts with the Jet Squelcher at an advantage. I'm in their zone, but they're not in mine. Remember how we talked about zoning in the A rank video? Same concept. I have to duck behind cover to get out of their range. As the tower with my teammate on it advances, I predict that the Jet Squelcher might want to move back away from it, putting them here. I don't want them there, because from there they can use their range advantage against me. I throw a bomb to force them out of this zone. The Jet Squelcher has to move away from my bomb and decides to move towards me and engage. I dodge behind cover as I'm closing distance with them, making them miss their shots and letting me re-engage unpredictably once I have my aim on and feel like the timing is right. I get this splat pretty cleanly. Could they have played this fight better? Yes, but the best play was probably not to engage at all. My weapon splats faster than theirs does. My bomb painted up their escape route. So once they swam forward, they were stuck in my zone, and it was a pretty free splat for me. The way they played the engagement after that one decision is almost irrelevant. But then the tri slosher comes up from behind me. They should be able to get this splat. They've hit me once before I even see them. The difference is just that players at this rank aren't moving and disengaging in combat as quickly and efficiently as I am. This player won't have seen movement like mine at their level, so they don't think to compensate for me swim strafing away. They could have aimed the second slosh higher and further, so that it has a wider arc and is more likely to hit me as I move. Their third slosh just straight up misses, even though at that point I actually haven't moved since their second one. That's not their only mistake though. Even when they miss, they still have a chance to get away but they need to be dodging behind cover, or at least moving, so I miss my shots. They fall into a minor case of walk-and-shoot syndrome, like we talked about in the B-Rank video. Chasing the splat. Is this a mechanical outplay? Yes. I get my aim on almost immediately, and still could have lost to the tri slosher if they had hit either of their two sloshes. But aim is something everyone knows is difficult, and it's something everyone who's looking to improve is always working on. As long as you're spending a few minutes in the training room doing thoughtful drills to warm up before you play each time, there's not a lot more you can do about it in the short term. So if you're already working on this skill, just know you're doing all you can and don't beat yourself up about missing shots here and there. It'll come with time. I think the part it would be helpful for these players to focus on is the tactical error they each made. They didn't see the movement options I had available and couldn't account for them. The Jet Squelcher gave up their range advantage against a weapon that splats faster. The Tri Slosher didn't take advantage of the wide arc their weapon has to cover all my movement options. With time, and the higher they rise through the ranks, they'll see more players that play like me and get better at tracking them. 
They'll learn through trial and error what options their opponents have, and they'll learn to play safer and give themselves more time to cut those options off. If you're trying to aim and missing shots, stop shooting and move somewhere more advantageous or somewhere your opponent doesn't expect. This will usually buy you more time to get your aim on than if you'd stood still and let your opponent draw a bead on you. The stronger the player is, the more times they're capable of disengaging and making an opponent miss during fights before they're splatted. People's aim improves as their ability to dodge improves, so don't expect to ever be able to just run around in circles and make people miss forever, but the movement can still often keep you alive long enough for you to get your aim on. Learn to paint your feet tactically to let you dodge your way out of tight spots. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, until you get to a position you can win from. Even if you do have better aim and a good position, you can still misplay a situation and lose if your opponent has a read on you. For example, some players at this rank can be baited into dropping down on you from ledges. See this charger? They had an advantage being above me, because I don't have a clean way to hit them with the Rainmaker. But when they dropped down, now they were much easier to shoot. Don't be quick to surrender height advantage. A lot of players fall into predictable patterns like this at this rank. Drop on me, drop on me. Thank you. Knew he was gonna drop. This roller here terrifies me, because they one-shot me if they get close to me, and they can hit me around either of these two blind corners if I'm not careful. They start moving in this direction, which I see, and they should know I can see it. I paint it up so they can't approach me from there and end up splatting them by mistake. If they had fainted going this way and gone the other way, they would have been able to close the distance between us fast enough to catch me. Instead, they got caught doing the predictable move. Fighting game players often refer to a concept they refer to as yomi layers. Yomi is the Japanese word for reading. Used in this context, it refers to how far into a situation a player is going to infer or read what their opponent will do next. Which is super scary. Oh, uh oh. That's the Larian in the spark after the disrespect from Sonic. The According to the system devised by David Serlin, Yobi Layer Zero is the play that you would expect just from knowing the objective of the game. This roller wants to splat me. They can splat me if they get to the side of the box I'm on. So they move to the side of the box I'm on, taking the shortest path to get there. This is the level that the roller is thinking on. They have an objective, and they're going to take the simplest possible route to complete that objective. They rush me right away. The problem with that is that they're not considering that I saw their position. Since I know their objective, they need to consider that I might take measures to counter it. If I predict their move and counter it, I'm acting on Yomi Layer 1, choosing a counter to their most likely option. I only intend to stop them from moving in that direction and painting their route to me, not thinking that they'll push straight away. Knowing that I could catch them like I ended up doing, they could have acted like they were going to my right to get me to move over there and shoot, and then taken advantage of the time it took me to do that to get around on the left side and splat me from there. That would have been Yomi Layer 2, baiting my counter out and doing something that beats it instead. Okay, let's go play at that box, because it's really aggravating. Just kidding! Oh, Sykes! They could even go further and predict that I'm going to check the left if I don't find them on the right. They could move toward the right, sit there for a second, make me think they moved back to the left, and then actually go on the right, making me move right, then left, and then get splatted on the right. Experience with the game will give you ways to exploit predictable opponents. That said, X-Rank players start to get more disciplined about falling for traps like these, so don't get too used to relying on reads. Have a plan for how to play fights so that even if the opponent can read your mind, you're still keeping yourself safe and forcing them into disadvantageous positions. To give some perspective, if you're in S rank, you've made it into the top 15% of Splatoon 2 players. Most people who make it this far have a pretty significant number of hours in the game, or at least in Splatoon 1, and might be toying with the idea of getting serious about it and dipping their toes into competitive play. At this point, figuring out how to improve at the game is becoming a question of how well you can align yourself with the competitive community. Competitive players have thousands of hours in the game. If you can recognize a pattern in how a strong player approaches the game, 
That pattern probably exists because they've tried a lot of different things, and what they're doing is more effective than the alternatives. Motion controls beats stick controls by far. S-Rank is where I started getting into competitive play. And while it's a little early for you to really know what you're doing, I think it's better to start getting exposed to the competitive community earlier than later, even if you don't plan to be seriously involved in it. If you do seriously want to find a team and compete, the competitive community are your people. They've been in your shoes and they know how to help you. They'll be great friends and teammates if you put yourself out there in a positive way. If you aren't interested in playing on a competitive team, you'll still learn a lot about the game and get a better appreciation of it from hanging around players and streamers who do. Never change Stingray. Never change it. At earlier ranks, you'll still find people who are figuring out the mechanics of Splatoon 2. Players in B and C rank aren't great at throwing clams in the basket, for example. In A rank, they start to get better at it, and by the S ranks, you'll start to see people executing tactics like passing clams around to create a power clam when you need to score, or painting their feet and moving around the pillar to protect themselves while riding the tower. The kind of knowledge you'll need to start developing isn't as much about understanding the way the game is programmed anymore. Aside from maybe a couple movement optimizations like ledge cancelling and substrafing, there probably isn't much about the game's mechanics you haven't learned yet. At this point, to improve more, you need to start learning the metagame. Let's talk about that term for a second in case you aren't as familiar with competitive gaming and haven't heard it before. Strategies in competitive games change much in the way that species evolve. Just like how a species that isn't adapted to its environment will die out over time, if a strategy isn't working, people stop doing it. Stronger strategies that work better and go further in tournaments will be seen by more players and be imitated more often. If you stick with the game for a while, you start to learn what other people tend to do, what the strong strategies are right now, and you try to learn how to beat them. What I would say is that you play the traditional Accelerated Dragon in this move order with Knight C6 and Pawn to Jesus. Now I know it's a little bit advanced, but we are talking at a Grandmaster level. Um, Normally, it's considered that white is significantly better after pushing the pawn to c4. White gets these two pawns on c4 and e4, and this is called the Meroxy Bind. The metagame is the set of strategies that someone who plays at a very high level will gravitate toward. While the game allows for many strategies, like running four silver arrow sprays wearing nothing but bomb defense, the metagame is a much smaller set of strategies that have actually proven to be effective. While the vast majority of weapons in Splatoon are viable and can be seen pretty high up the ladder, over time competitive players will develop an idea of which weapons are stronger than others. When great players showcase a strong strategy, others tend to flock to that strategy to try and figure out how it works and adapt it to their teams and playstyles. Weapons or strategies are chosen or discarded based on how well they do against the meta strategy since what's meta at the time is more likely to be seen in tournaments and solo queue. Splatoon has been receiving patches regularly, so the game's balance is always changing, and the scientific process is always in full swing in the competitive community. You'll find lively debate about how high-level Splatoon should be played in all sorts of places. On one hand, I really don't like telling people, oh, don't worry about the meta, because a lot of players who are eager to downplay its importance are sticking to strategies that really don't work very well. Back in the C-Rank video, one of the first things I talked about was the importance of humility, being able to set aside your pride and listen to someone else's advice instead of stubbornly sticking to what you had been doing. On the other hand, I still think you should take most claims about the meta with a grain of salt. Most people who claim they know what the metagame is don't really know why it is that way. And the top players who have really analyzed the game effectively are playing a vastly different game than you are. It's rated way worse in this game than it is in the first game. Even if people find it more annoying, this weapon's significantly worse on any tier list than it ever was in the first game. And most of it is because it- It's also worth noting that Japanese players, isolated from us by time zones and a language barrier, have always developed their own wildly different metagame. And Western players are routinely surprised by the unique strategies and weapon choices is they're able to make work at the tournaments that we do see them compete in. If you really want to play a weapon, and playing that weapon is the way you enjoy the game the most, you'll get more out of Splatoon 2 by playing that weapon.
Yes, I guess even that one. Although, if your goal is to play well and advance through the ranks, you may find that there's actually another weapon that does what you want to do better than what you're using. And that's what knowing the metagame is useful for. The meta also has a lot to do with the combination of weapons and specials you put together. We won't spend much time talking about this because in ranked, you can't control what your teammates play. But it does still impact what weapons they're choosing. Every weapon has weaknesses, and running a variety of weapons on a team comp helps compensate for one weapon's weaknesses with another weapon's strengths. If a combination of weapons proves to be strong and popular, many people will use it, which means that if you find a unique way to counter that strategy, you can suddenly beat players who are trying to run the meta composition, even if what you're doing might not work as well in other situations. I am your shield. Since people are always looking for these counters, the meta is constantly changing, and it's a lot less restrictive of creative strategies than people often think. Splatoon players generally group weapons into categories based on their range and the roles they're best at playing. You'll hear people refer to range as frontline, midline, and backline. This already tells you a lot about each weapon. Frontline weapons have to get up close and personal to splat someone. Backline weapons can splat someone from practically half the map away. That means frontline weapons are most likely going to position more aggressively. But there are exceptions to this rule. For example, the Splattershot Junior is a common weapon to see in competitive play, and it has very short range, but it's often played very passively, because it still benefits the team by throwing a lot of bombs from far away and painting for quick ink armors. It's more useful and accurate to classify the weapons based on what those weapons are good at doing. Much of the Western Splatoon community's understanding of weapon roles is inspired by an analyst called FLC, who wrote Fluid Priorities and Roles in Splatoon 2. While this was written several years ago, and many patches ago, the overall framework he sets up still largely describes the way we view the game today. I highly recommend giving it a read if you aren't familiar with it. Also, FLC does still stream, so if you want an up-to-date perspective, you can always hang out at his Twitch channel. FLC starts by defining the Anchor, typically played by backliners like Chargers and the larger Splatlings. You'll also see Jet Squelchers and Exploshers play this role, and some teams choose not to run a backliner at all in favor of a more aggressive composition. An Anchor's number one job is not to get splatted. They will try to position further back than anyone else on the team, because they have longer range than frontline or midline weapons, and they can still have an impact on the game from far away. Because they're positioned at a safe distance a lot of the time, they're great players for the rest of the team to super jump to when they get splatted. This is where the term anchor comes from. As long as the backliner is still in play, the rest of the team can't really be pushed away. FLC assigns most frontline and midline weapons two different roles, Slayer and Skirmisher. A Skirmisher's job is to start fights, kite back, be threatening, and survive for as long as possible. In short, they want to keep the opponent busy without getting splatted. Tetra Dooleys, Custom Dooley Squelchers, Brushes, Tentabrellas, the Kensa 52 Gal, Rapid Blasters, and Dynamo Rollers are popular examples of this role right now. Some are good at surviving because they have unique movement mechanics that get them out of harm's way quickly, others because they have walls or shields built into their kit, and yet others because they can position safely and hit players that are behind cover. A Slayer's job is to bide their time and wait for the right moment before engaging and splatting enemy players while they're focused on something else, like the objective or a skirmisher. Common examples include Splatter Shots, the Splushomatic 7, the Tri Slosher, the Kensa Splattershot Pro, and any short range blasters, dualies, or rollers. A good Slayer feels like they came out of nowhere, getting multiple splats before you can react to them and creating space for their team by putting the enemy team at a numbers disadvantage. They can move quickly and efficiently, so they can seize opportunities as soon as they present themselves, and react quickly to unforeseen threats once they've committed to a fight. Some weapons are put into team comps just because they paint a lot and get specials pretty quickly, something FLC would call special utility. Splattershot Juniors are renowned for painting everything, getting armor obscenely quickly, and not doing much else besides throwing a bunch of bombs in the meantime. They can move pretty well and have a fast fire rate, but their short range and low accuracy makes them better for painting in a lot of situations where something like a splatter shot would decide to fight. 
There are other armor farmer weapons with a similarly paint-focused playstyle, like the Kensa Undercover Umbrella, and to a lesser extent the Anzap 85, Kensa Glugadulis, the H3 Nozzle Nose D, and the 96 Gal. Aside from armor, some other specials can carry a weapon like this as well. The Neo splash matic is alright in fights, but really shines when it comes to taking control of an area with paint and its bomb rush. The custom Jet Squelcher isn't a bad weapon on its own merits, but many players on current patch choose to use it to paint for Stingrays constantly, so their opponents can never stay on objectives like the Tower or the Rainmaker for too long. FLC begins this discussion by emphasizing that you will play multiple roles during any game. While yes, the Splattershot is usually a great example of the Slayer role, if they're the last player up and the other team doesn't know where they are, Trying to fight isn't a good idea, they're better off backing up a little bit, ducking around a corner and giving their team jumps like an anchor would. If a Tetradulis player, normally a skirmisher, hasn't been seen and their teammate is getting engaged on, they can play the Slayer role and rush in to take out the unaware opponent. Take a look at your weapon and think about how well it suits the role you're trying to play with it. Is there a similar weapon with a better sub or special that could do the same thing more effectively? Is the main weapon not as well suited to the job as you would like? Now is the time to learn what higher level players try to play in that role, and evaluate whether the weapon you're playing is the best one for the job. There's also a generally understood concept of what combinations of weapons to run, and where certain weapons should position on a given map or mode. For example, on Anchovy Games, aggressive short-ranged weapons are generally going to push this area, called Plat, to clear it of the backline and support weapons that tend to position there for the height advantage. Knowing this pattern both helps you understand what to do as an aggressive weapon, and also makes you more aware of what you'll need to be watching out for as a backliner. This kind of information doesn't help you at all if you aren't seeing these patterns of movement develop in front of you. You're past the point where you're going to be able to skate by on just wandering into the enemy team without help from your allies. You need to know where people are on the map. It's probably obvious that knowing where your opponents are on the map is important, though that doesn't mean people are good at it yet. Even if you can't see them, just knowing where they were recently gives you half an idea of where they could possibly be now. Don't carelessly wander into an area if you recently saw an opponent nearby. But what's also important is paying attention to where your teammates are. If you don't have teammates nearby, you could wander into a 2v1, or a 4v1. While you can't communicate with them in ranked, if you stick with them, they'll probably at least try to shoot someone who's shooting you. If you can do the same, voila, that's teamwork. If you're missing opportunities to do so by not noticing what's going on around you, that can turn fights in the other team's favor pretty quickly. Poor map awareness is an issue that people talk about a lot, and it's an easy thing to notice in hindsight, but just knowing that you weren't aware of something doesn't get you closer to solving the problem. When you make an error, try to figure out what your next steps are going to be. Studying video of your gameplay helps a lot with this. You need to resolve the problem proactively by changing your approach to future games. Maybe you resolve to hold the map screen open the entire time you're splatted. This is also a great strategy for ignoring that someone is taunting you. Maybe you establish a rule that you won't push past the middle of the map unless you have at least one teammate pushing in the same direction within your weapon's range. Maybe you make sure to stay within a charger's range of the objective at all times, which forces you to keep constant tabs on where your objective is. Maybe your camera control is preventing you from seeing information that should have been available to you. Maybe you're watching your own inkling when you should be spending more of your focus on processing what's in your peripheral vision since danger is more likely to come from your peripheral vision than right in front of you. Map awareness isn't just about understanding where players are on the map, but also where they should be. If you're in a 1v4, you probably shouldn't be trying to play the objective, since it'll be so easy for your opponents to force you away from it or splat you. If you have a numbers advantage, you probably shouldn't be chasing someone trying to splat them, since they can't stop you from playing the objective anyway. If your opponents are riding the tower into your spawn here, you probably shouldn't be positioned here. Yes, I know I've used this clip before, but I'm still mad about it. Come up with a plan to fix your map awareness, and follow through on it. 
if you consistently forget to put it into practice, find a better way to think about it that you will actually apply in the moment. Evaluate whether you're remembering to do it and whether it's improving your results. In my experience, players that can make it into S rank can generally make it out into S plus fairly quickly. And these tips really apply a good ways up through S plus. S plus is where the real grind to X rank begins. We'll see you soon enough with some tips for making it through that. For now, focus on your own learning and improvement. If you play to learn instead of playing to win, you won't get so hung up on your teammates' mistakes, annoying map mode combinations, lag, or other transitory grievances. You'll just get better, and you'll get better faster, and better results will come surprisingly quickly. Good luck out there.